Good morning. Welcome to the online ministry of Pitcock United Methodist Church. Pitcock UMC is located about halfway between Gatesville and Coppers Cove on FM 116. We're holding in-person services outdoors under our pavilion at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. If you'd like to come be with us and participate in, a, in an in-person service, we're maintaining social distance and all the other guidelines that need to be followed in order to make sure that we're being as safe as we possibly can. In our, uh, in our time together. So if you'd like to be part of that in-person worship service, come be with us at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings. Also, we're beginning a new Bible study, actually a Bible reading program on September the 15th. We're using the Immerse Bible reading program, uh, which is the New Living Translation of the Bible uh, without chapter divisions or verse divisions or any of the other notes or anything like that that usually come with Bible uh, with, with, typical, with your typical Bibles, especially study Bibles. The reason for this is so that we're have, we have nothing in our reading to distract us from the text itself, so that we have our maximum amount of engagement with the text. What we do is, once we begin our reading program, we come together uh, every Tuesday night and discuss what we've read that, that day. We're guided by just a few questions, uh, just to guide our discussion so that we're answering the right questions. Uh, from what we've read. So if you'd like to be part of that Bible study, please get in contact with me uh, and I'll tell you how you can be part of that Bible study Bible reading program. My contact information is at the end of this video presentation. And now let's begin our time of worship with a moment of prayer. Almighty God, we come before your throne this morning to bring praise and adoration to your name. We come seeking your guidance and your help as we look to your word and seek to know the truth of it. Guide us as we open our Bibles this morning and seek to know your will. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And now, I want to talk all our attention to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew's Gospel chapter 18. We're going to read here in just a moment, but first I want to give you just a little bit of a commentary about this chapter. Matthew chapter 18 is the fourth of what's referred to by most commentators as the teaching discourses that Jesus gives us in Matthew's Gospel. This is the fourth of five, the fifth one being the so-called Olivet Discourse in which he talks about the end times. But here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is giving us an overview of the kingdom, how the kingdom will operate, how it will function. And interestingly enough, as we begin to, to read this chapter, we find that he's giving us an inverse view of what the world sees as valuable. The kingdom, he says, is not like that. The question comes to him, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he says, the greatest is this one like a little child. This one who's as humble as a little child, who's as, who's as pliable as a little child. And he says, that one is the one who's most valuable, the, the, of the, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But then he talks about the place of sin, and there's an inversion here as well. In the world, we look at sin as, as greater or lesser sins. And yet Jesus said if we do anything that causes one of these little ones to stumble, and that's easy to do with a child. If we do anything that causes one of these little ones to stumble, he said it would be better if we had a millstone hung around our necks and we were thrown into the sea and drowned. Now that's pretty extreme, isn't it? But what he's using is a, is a, a linguistic a linguistic technique called hyperbola, an exaggeration to make a point. Likewise, in the next few verses, Jesus talks about, about temptation. Anyone who causes one of these little ones to be tempted, who breaks the law, who sins and causes a little one to be tempted. He said, if you're tempted, he said, it's better to cut off your hand or your foot or pluck out your eye and enter into life maimed than to, be, than to lose your life. The idea being that that our, we're not to make light of sin. Sin is such a severe thing that we're to avoid it, even at the cost of severely disciplining ourselves. The idea here is one not of asceticism, but one of, as Paul talks about, keeping, our, keeping a watch on ourselves, lest, as he said, when we preach to others, we ourselves should become castaways. So you see this inversion that Jesus gives us here in this passage of Scripture. Now the verses we're going to focus on this morning, verses 15 through 20, are another type of inversion that he gives us here in this same train of thought. He's still describing the kingdom, still describing how the kingdom will operate. 
So begin reading with me, if you will, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. We're going to start reading again in verse 15 and continue to verse 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we see the, the necessity of order in the church. It's like he gives us these things in an inverse order. If we were doing it, we would start with the organization. <clears throat> We'd start with how, this is how the church is organized. Here's where the hierarchy is. Here's where, here's who's in charge. Here who has, here's who has authority. Here's, you know, here's where everybody's position is. And then we'd look at, here are the things that we're to guide, be guided by as we go through that. And then here's what to do whenever there's a disruption in the order in the church. But notice that Jesus begins with the order in the church. If anyone sins against you, he said. Now, the most ancient manuscripts don't include that if someone sins against you. They simply include if a brother sins. Now, I don't believe the newer translations do any, any damage to the context, but simply to say that the focus here is on one who's departed from the, from the faith in the sense that they've broken, they've broken God's will. They've gone against the teaching that they've received, either from, uh, either from the Old Testament teaching, which would have been the focus in that day, or the teachings of Jesus and those who came after him uh, writing in the New Testament. As we, as we look at this, we see the focus here is not on, not on whether, not on the sin, but on restoring the one who sinned. The idea is to, is to go to that one to bring that one to that one's attention the fact that they've that they've created an offense. The idea again is not to you know is not to straighten them out, but it's to give them the opportunity to look and see where they've gone astray and to repent of that and to be restored. I believe the reason why you go by yourself first is to avoid embarrassing that person so that they're not defensive in this in, in the sense of having to defend themselves before the church but they have the opportunity to say, oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Because many sins are committed out of either, either ignorance or neglect, just pure carelessness. But then if, that's, if the person still won't be persuaded, then the idea is to take back one or two others with you. People who are like you, concerned about the welfare, concerned about the well-being of that person. Again, not trying to straighten that person out because we realize that we can be tempted and go astray just as easily as anyone else. But we're in, in good faith trying to help that person be restored into full fellowship, first with the church and then with God. That person still won't hear two or three. Then you take it to the church, to the church as a whole. Not in a, in a sense of a judicial, a judicial uh, type of a setting, but in the sense simply of coming to the church and the church saying to him, please, consider, reconsider. Consider what you're doing. Consider what you've done. Come to that place where you recognize the false, the, fa the fallacy or the sin in what you've done and repent and be restored. Again, the idea is on restoration. Remember, Jesus talked about in the passages prior to this, he talked about the 90 and 9. Uh, you know, we know that from Luke's gospel, how the, the shepherd had the 99 sheep, the 100 sheep, and one of them was missing. And he left the 99 and went to find the one that was missing. And he talks about the rejoicing in heaven over that one sinner who repents. Here, that story, the story is used in a slightly different way, saying to us that that one is just as valuable as the 99 who reside in the fold. That God will go to great lengths to restore that one to the fold. And then he goes into this thing of restoring a sinning brother or sister. Again, it's an inversion. 
in our, in our eyes, one who doesn't want to stay, one who doesn't want to follow the teachings of the church, one who doesn't want to, re to uh, remain in sound doctrine. He's like, well, let them go. And yet, God says, no, that one's important to me. Do everything you can to restore that one, to help them come back to where they know they need to be. But then he says something quite interesting. He said, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, back in Matthew chapter 16, at, uh, when, with Peter's confession, when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus followed that by telling the disciples, speaking to, to Peter that he was going to give him the keys of the kingdom, and whatever he loosed bound on earth would be bound in heaven, and whatever he loosed on earth would be loosed in heaven. The idea being that Peter would have revelation or have wisdom to know what was acceptable based on the teachings of the scripture and how God wanted those scriptures interpreted so that we could, he would know what the application of those scriptures were and where that particular application was appropriate in a given situation. Here it's more of the sense of giving to us the idea that if, if we, when this, once we've dealt with this person, to make a judgment to say, have they really repented? Do we retain that person's sin? Do we bind that person's sin to them? Or do we loose them from it? Do we accept their repentance? This is not for us to do. It's not our responsibility to judge. It's simply our responsibility to judge whether, not to judge, but to discern, that's a better word for it, to discern whether or not this person has truly repented and come back to that place where they're supposed to be. Come back into the fellowship, first the fellowship with God and then the fellowship with the church. And then he says something else interesting. He says if two, or, if two of you agree on anything, he's setting a minimum here. Uh, this idea of, re, of, of, a, of agreement is to ensure that we're not praying selfishly. And we're not praying something that's just for us, but that we're praying something that others also see the value in, that others agree with us on. And then he talks about, then he talks about under, about our how two or three being gathered together gives him a place to be right in the middle of us. Again, he's setting a minimum number, with the idea in mind that this minimal number, this minimal number two or three, is sufficient. For him to be want to be in our midst, it's a it's a gathering. It's a uh, it's it's a gathering of the body. It's a gathering of those who are following Christ. They're those who are agreed uh, on on doctrine, who are agreed on on the, the will of God, who are agreed on the direction that they should be going, so that they're open to receiving the witness of Christ in their midst, as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Again, discernment plays a huge role in this. So we see in these, three, uh, in these three instances, we see, first of all, order in the church. Then we see discovery, discovering what God is trying to say to us in a particular situation. Are we really being fair to the person that we're talking to about their sin? Are we hearing and understanding uh, what, they're, what they're trying to tell us? Are we receptive to their willingness to repent? You know, we live in a day and age when, uh, when to make people guilty, uh, it seems to be the thing, to own people, to make them own up to some comment they've made or some, some past action that they've done without ever have, giving that person the opportunity to be forgiven. What Jesus is saying in these discoveries is you have the opportunity to forgive, to extend God's forgiveness to that person to be the, uh, the active agent, the visible, tangible agent of forgiveness to that person who wants to come back and be restored to the fellowship of God's people, who wants to be restored to fellowship with God. If we're going to be the people of God, we need to understand what that means. And I believe that what Jesus is teaching here, uh, here in Matthew chapter 18 is a, good, is a good place to start with that, good place for us to understand that the church, the kingdom of God, if you will, does not follow the world's values. We don't follow the world's methodologies. We don't follow the world's, uh, the world's uh, techniques of how they do things. We listen to the Spirit of God. We listen to the Word of God. We watch and work with our brothers and sisters so that we can help them. 
back in the in the 1700s when John Wesley uh, set up first set up his Methodist classes as he called them. Uh, these classes, more than anything else, were accountability groups. The members of those classes would, as they met weekly or monthly, the members of those classes would constantly challenge each other with the question, how is it with your soul? They would ask that question not like we do where we meet someone and say, well, how are you doing? And we really don't want to hear it. We're just being, just making conversation, just being polite. But that question, how is it with your soul, was not a polite inquiry. It was, a, it was a question, a deep probing question. How is it with your soul? Are you following God? Are you watching His Word and living by His Word? Are you open to the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit working in you and moving with you? As Wesley would put it, are you moving on to perfection? Accountability is right, is right at the heart of what we're talking about here. But it's not accountability to me or accountability to another pastor or accountability to some other church member. It's accountability to God. And our role in this is not to hold people accountable, but to help them to understand where accountability lies and to help them be accountable, first of all to God and then to the others. Because sin has an impact on the entire church. If someone is, is living in sin, that has a detrimental effect, effect on the church of God at large, certainly on the local congregation, certainly on that person's family, but also on the church at large. And Jesus is saying it's important that that person be restored. I don't want them to be, to be judged. I don't want them to feel guilty. I want them to be forgiven and to be restored. I want you as the church to be able to understand how that person has come, how, how they've come seeking forgiveness and restoration and to support them in that, to help them in that. And then finally to agree with them and with everyone else th that they should be restored and are being restored so that as you gather, I can be in your midst. We have a great opportunity as we, as we work together as Christ's church to help one another to hold each other accountable and to, to help each other stay in fellowship with, with God, to stay in, in align, alignment with the scriptures, to stay in fellowship with one another. This is a communion. The church is a communion. A place where we come together and we commune with each other, we call that fellowship, but also where we commune with God. And all of these things that we've talked about are involved in that communion. Wouldn't you like to be part of the communion of God's people? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise that you don't want to judge us. You want to see us restored. You want to see us brought back into fellowship. You want to see us thriving in the fellowship, the communion of God's people within your church. We thank you for that, and we pray that we would grasp that truth today and that we would seek restoration where it's needed, that we would help one another to remain accountable, uh, to remain faithful to that fellowship and in that communion. And all this we ask you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I want to thank you for being with us this morning. May God bless you.